שבת שלום. What a privilege it is again to be together on the glorious Shabbat, the day that our Father has given us. So, each time on a Friday evening when we blow the shofar, we announce that the work week has come to an end, and now it's a time of rest. But it's an active rest. It's a rest in our Father's presence. Yeah, we may sleep a little bit as well. And I'm sure many of us will do later this afternoon again. But it is an active rest in our Father. And it's a, pay, a time of, of recalibration. Blow the shofar and it's this call for come into my rest. And it's also a call for the revelation of the Messiah, because he is the king over Shabbat, for him to be revealed. A few months back we spoke about the fact that the word apocalypse only occurs once in Scripture. 66 books, thousands and thousands of words, only once the word apocalypse appear. And if we've got this sort of mental image of apocalypse that's been given to us through the media and through films as this absolutely horrific event of death and destruction and total collapse of everything, where the one place where it does occur is to say that it's the apocalypse of Messiah Yeshua, Revelations 1 verse 1. It is the revelation of the Messiah. It is the apocalypse of the Messiah. And how glorious is that? So we've been told by the media and through, me, uh, and through Hollywood that the apocalypse is terrible. And we've got these images sort of imprinted on us of cities and streets that looks like some other world. And that's the sort of appre appreciation that we've got for the word apocalypse. Meanwhile, it just means... It is the revelation of the Messiah, and we should see his glory and his majesty in him being the revealed one. And so we have to recalibrate our thinking about this quite a lot. Moreover, in the Torah reading of this week, Vayigash, we have this incredibly famous words. I am Joseph. Is my father well? The revelation of Joseph. The apocalypse of Joseph, you could say. And Joseph is a type of Messiah. And so in this Vayegash, the revelation of Joseph... We have to learn and we have to glean elements about the revelation of Messiah. Because as we understand the apocalypse of Joseph, we might start to understand the apocalypse of Yeshua, our Messiah, better and better and better. And I believe that is why we've got Vayegash, the revelation, the apocalypse of Joseph so that we can understand the apocalypse of Messiah better. Now, quick question. That Vayagas portion of this week, the apocalypse of Joseph, the revelation of Joseph to his brother, was that, did that, was that coincided with trauma in the family or happiness in the family? Absolute celebration. So if the apocalypse of Joseph was sort of run hand in hand with total celebration in the family, what is it about the apocalypse of Yeshua? Celebration about the family. Hallelujah. So I took this picture. Where did I took this picture? Surely many of you will know. Get the money. So, on the Mount of Olives, there is this small cluster of trees, which is claimed to be 
the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know whether it is. It's claimed to be. It's claimed to be that these olive trees are 2,000 years old. I don't know whether they are. I do know they're very old. But I took this, a couple of pictures there, but then in preparation for, for today, I was reminded of this picture, of this olive tree standing on the Mount of Olives. And if you look at it, what is the sort of the first thing that you observe from this tree, this olive tree on the Mount of Olives? It's very old, that's true. There's damage to it then. It's, but it's still vibrant, it's still green. But there are two stems from this one tree. There are two stems from this one tree. Now, as you all know, every Torah portion has got its haftarah, and it's running parallel, its portion in the apostol apostolic scriptures, the New Testament. And the one that goes with the haftarah that goes with this week is Ezekiel 37. So I'm not going to talk too much about Ezekiel 37, but I thought that it's worth our while to read that prophecy in full. Because for once in a year, you can obviously read Ezekiel 37 any time of the year, any day, any month, doesn't matter. But for once in a year, the entire world, everybody that's sensitive to our Father's Torah cycle, read and contemplate Ezekiel 37. And there is something like a corporate blessing. When the entire body of Messiah, doesn't matter where they are in the world, focuses on one thing, on a specific Shabbat. So on this Shabbat, the entire world, wherever the Torah is being read and the Haftarah is being read, Ezekiel 37 is read. And I thought, let's not miss this opportunity. Let's read it together. And the word of Jehovah came to me saying, And you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children, B'nai of Israel. And, and take another stick and write on it for Yosef, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house called by it of Israel, his companions. And right off the bat we see the difference. The one is B'nai Israel, the other one is called by it. The one is the children of Israel, the other one is the entire household. But both Judah and Joseph and their companions, Haver, it means those who are associated with. Judah and the children of Israel, which probably means Benjamin and Levi, the southern uh, two and a half tribes. And everybody that was associated with them, their chaver, their companions. But then for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for the entire house, the kol bayit of Israel, and everybody that is associated with them. Do you find yourself in there? Can you see your own name in there? Part of the kol bayit the entire household and the companions, the associates, the ones that walks with. Then bring them together for yourself into one stick and they shall become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, won't you show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says Master Jehovah, see I am taking the stick of Yosef, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I shall give them unto him with the stick of Yehuda, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. 
and the sticks on which you write shall be in your hand before their eyes, and speak to them. Thus says, said the master Jehovah, See, I am taking the children of Israel from among the Gentiles. Does that sound familiar? Can you relate to that? See, I am taking the children of Israel from among the Gentiles, wherever they have gone, and shall gather them from all around, and I shall bring them into their land, and I shall make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Has that happened? Are we anticipating that? And by the glory and the grace and the kindness of our Father, may we participate in that. And one sovereign shall be sovereign over them all, and let them no longer be two nations, and let them no longer be divided into two reigns. So they will be two reigns, and they will function as two reigns, but there will come a time when they will unite that, like that olive tree that split, but that is actually has got one root. And they shall no longer defile themselves with their idols, nor with their disgusting matters, nor with any of their transgressions. And I shall save them from all the dwelling places in which they have sinned. And I shall cleanse them. Baruch Hashem. And they shall be my people, and I be their Elohim, while David, my servant, is sovereign over them. Thank you, Yeshua, that you will be sovereign over us in the land. Hallelujah. And they shall all have one shepherd and walk in my right rulings and guard my laws and shall do them. Our master, Yeshua, our shepherd, will guide us in the right rulings of his laws and we shall do them. Can we start practicing that today? Yes. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given them uh, given to your ark of my servant where your fathers dwelt and they shall dwell in it they and their children and their children's children forever and my servant David be their prince forever and I shall make a covenant of peace with them an everlasting covenant it is with them and I shall place them and increase them and shall place my set apart place in their midst forever. He will dwell among us. His tabernacle will be among us forever. And my dwelling place shall be over them, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. And the Gentiles shall know that I, Jehovah, am setting Israel apart when my set-apart place is in their midst forever. Hallelujah. And everybody in the world who is following our Father's cycles and His appointments, to them, there's a focus on this prophecy today. And I think as the years tick by, and this becomes more significant and more significant because the time when this, these events will take place just grew shorter and shorter and shorter. When it will happen, we don't know. But what we do know is that it's getting shorter. But what we also know is that this provides us with a a template in terms of how we should pray. If this is prophecy, which it is, if this is the word of our Father, which it is, then this provides us with a clear template for what we have to pray and for what we have to reach out for. Not for any form of human-made doctrine or human-made and humanitarian perspective of life. But let's pray into prophecy. Let's pray into these. Because then we know we pray according to our Father's word. Before continuing, just a quick reflection on last year, and then I'll pick it up from there on. So last year I had this slide, and last year the focus was on Judah's character development, 
an incredible development of his character over a couple of chapters. It started out with Judah being this person that is full of deceit, complicity, and lies. Not somebody that you would like to make the leader of a tribe. It was followed by the Tamar episode. Separation, where he moved away from the brothers. Fell into sin. Committed all kinds of treachery. But the end of the story with Tamar is that he acknowledged that he's wrong. He acknowledged that there are people more righteous than he. And he turned his heart. After the episode with Tamar, he went back. And then with Jacob, he said, I will stand in the gap for Benjamin. I will not do the same mistake as what has happened with Joseph. I will stand in the gap this time. Which is then followed with this meeting with Joseph, where he had this incredible prayer of repentance, followed with a desire to draw near Joseph, not even knowing who Joseph is. But then, where he intercedes for an other brother. And the moment when he started to intercede for the other brother, Benjamin, I am Joseph. Now the season is right. Now the opportunity is right for the revelation of Joseph. The moment when he interceded for the other brother. When he looked away from his own situation, when he looked away from his own problems, when he looked away from his own guilt because that has been dealt with, when he was able to develop in himself and by the as I believe our Father has led him to become strong, he could stand in the gap for Benjamin. That was the key for which Joseph was waiting. And he could say, I am Joseph. And the unification could happen. We read in Genesis 44, And now if I came to you, your servant that is a different Judah from a few chapters before. My father and the boy is not with us. Since his own life is bound up in his life, pleading for the father. A few chapters earlier, he was part of the seat and con conspired to hurt the father with lies. Now he speaks into the father's heart. Say, since his own life is bound up in his life, meaning Benjamin, then it shall be when he sees that the boy, Benjamin, is not with us, that he shall die. If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall be a sinner before my father forever. I am Joseph. So, if we are starting to think in terms of Ezekiel 37 and the two sticks and what we are praying for in terms of the two sticks to come together and for Ezekiel 36 to materialize as a prophecy, what should we be doing? Intercede for the brother. Intercede for the brother. Because that's the key. Because it's shown here for us. How do you want to do that? How do you want to see Joseph? How do you want to see Yeshua? Look beyond yourself. Look beyond your own problems. Ask the Father to develop and to take you on a journey of development in character. To become strong. To stand in faith. To repent. To draw near. And to be able to intercede. Because in that is the seed for the revelation of our Messiah. So yes, the restoration and the reunion, the reunification of the family requires, it is an essential ingredient, maturity in character. Unfortunately, that maturity is often only reached through a long and painful period of growth. 
And often we want to skip over this. Just take the pain away. Just take the pain away. Please, just take the pain away. But we miss the thing, what is really the objective. The objective is for us to grow in our strength, in our maturity in the Father. To eventually reach beyond ourselves and to speak into the lives of others. Into a brother Benjamin for the life of a father. Whom we have deceived earlier. But now, whom we glorify and whom we honor And who we would like to serve. So I'm sure if we go around this auditorium and ask, have you perhaps gone through a painful time in your life? I'm sure 90% would have said, no, we just sit on the beach and we relax and it's cool. I'm sure. I, I see the confirmation on all of your faces. No, friends, that tree does not look like that because it was in a laboratorium stored away from the elements. It looks like that rugged because it had to face the elements and stand for thousands of years. Well, they say 2,000, hundreds of years. And out of that... He's strong. I can still be there. So, the question, however, is not whether we are going to go through painful times of trials in our lives, but how do we take it? How do we approach it? From what perspective do we do it? Uh, uh, Face the situation. Do we face it from, can we just get over and done and move on a bit? Or is it, Father, can you show us what form of character development I have to undergo here? What must I learn unto the revelation of the Messiah? How can the Messiah be revealed in this situation to the glory of the Father? We have said earlier, uh, two, two weeks ago actually, was the start of the Passover a message and so even in this and all the other Torah readings leading up to Passover even though it's only four months away three months away has got a Passover element in and that I believe is that we don't approach Passover that evening we come here and it's a glorious affair and it's 90 minutes or two hours and it's over for another year. No. It's a lead up and a preparation to that event so that it can become part of our beings and so that we can be strong in that. So that we can wither the storm like that tree has done. And it takes no rocket scientist to realize that the element of the Passover story here is, I am Joseph. I am the Messiah. I am the one that's been revealed. But in that process, we have to ask, what particular element or elements around Passover can we glean from from this reading? I believe there are a few, and I'm only going to touch on one. So we read from earlier readings in terms of the preparation for this famine that took place. Let Pharaoh do this, that was the counsel of Joseph, and let him appoint overseas over the land to take up one-fifth of the land of Mitzrayim in the seven years of plenty, and let them gather all the food, the ocal, of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep the food in the cities. And the food shall be for a store for the land for seven years of scarcity of food or ra'af, which shall be in the land of Egypt. And do not let the land be cut off by the scarcity of food, by the famine. 
And so we see a few key elements in this story, which I, I think is very familiar with all of us. There's grain. It starts with grain. Kernels, which is basically the seed. The seed for food, which is essential in a time of absence of food. And the two are contrasted. Food with its seed and the absence of food. And this contrast starts to become more and more important as the story unfolds. It's the one thing about scripture often that is so fascinating is that it is actually so elementary as well. It's so basic, it's so simple. It's seed for food or it's not. It's so simple as that. You either have it or you don't have it. So the absence of food or then the famine. And Yosef saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke to them harshly and said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Yosef remembered his dreams, which he had dreamt about them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my master, your servant have come to buy food. It's about food. And the scarcity or the absence of food was in all the lands. But in the land of Egypt, there was bread. So now it drills into the very specific type of food that was essential. But when all the land of Egypt hungered, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to them, to all the Egypts, go to Joseph, do whatever he says to you. And we then can expand on this one tiny bit. So there's the seed, and there's food, and there's famine. But the food in time of famine is bread. We need bread. And in there lies the key to the Passover story. What are we looking for? What are we looking for and how do we look for it? I think sometimes we are going through these processes, in, unfortunately, in a sense, a little bit too mechanical. What sort of famine do you and I experience in our lives? It's very rare that we will ex experience physical absence of bread. But there are many forms of famine. Emotional famine. Spiritual famine. When you go to the ATM and the bank is out of money because it says insufficient funds, then the bank is suffering from famine. Have you experienced that before in your life? It's quite interesting. My bank occasionally don't have money. Like, geez, we have to do something with this bank. There are various kinds of famine. They went to Joseph humbly, respectively, because they were in need of bread. But famine actually speaks about resource scarcity. And that resource scarcity could be anything in this case, with a physical hunger, it meant physical bread. But in line with Judah's character development, where it went through all kinds of trials and tribulations to soften him so that he can get to a point where he interceded for his brother Benjamin to the honor of his father, it was physical bread was what was required famine around the lack of food. But in your life, in my life, it could be something else where there's a resource scarcity. It could be money, it could be friendship, it could be an emotional pain, an emotional scar. It could be something that's lacking that we say, Father, I bring this to you. Please reveal yourself in this resource moment of resource scarcity for a father to be revealed in that situation 
So this famine is much broader than just the bread. So what resource? And now suddenly the ch- there's also a change in the entire dynamic because our, the brothers were craving for bread. What did they find? Joseph. So is it perhaps that part of the Passover story that we might be craving for something but we're actually asking for somebody, something else and we'll get something else, receive something else. And I believe that is part of what is hidden in this entire I am Joseph story. And it came to be when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my master. So Judah is now recounting the whole process to Joseph. That they went back to the father and said to the father what Joseph told them the first time. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. And Joseph was unable to restrain himself before all those who stood before him. And he, were, and he called out, have anyone come out from, from me? Have everyone go out from me? Sorry. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers and he wept aloud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? The key thing here is, is my father alive? Do what you and I are doing, does it bring glory to the father? It's no longer about me, Joseph, the second in charge of the most powerful dynasty in the world. Me, Joseph, who can actually crush you with the power of my punky if I want to. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were unable to answer him, for they trembled before him. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. And when they came near, he said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt, and now do not be grieved or displeased with yourselves because you sold me here, for Elohim sent me before you to preserve life. And as there was a character development in Judah, as we've seen, there's this massive character development in Joseph, that he has been able to go through all these trials to come to this revelation. I am Joseph. Is my father alive? Don't be worried. Don't worry. I came to preserve life. And then, at, at the end of the story, and he sent to his father this: ten donkeys loaded with the best of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and food for his father for the journey. And he said to his brothers, "Send his brothers away," and they left. And he said to them, "Do not quarrel along the way." So, and here's a key, where there's bread, where there's provision, where there is the unification, there's the risk of quarreling, but don't quarrel. There's the risk of quarreling, but don't quarrel. Because why? The moment that you start quarreling, the focus would be on us. It will be an inward focus. The moment that you're able to say, and that's what Joseph's direction and counsel, do not quarrel. So do not look inwards. Focus on the Father. Focus on what was happening. I'm going to return to this line a little bit later. And they went up out of Egypt and come in the lands of Canaan to Yaakov, their father, And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. I have underlined the times and the references to the Father. The entire emphasis has changed and has shifted to the Father and to the glory of the Father. The brothers, when they met, They have had a common purpose. 
to the glory of the Father. And if we think in terms of the two sticks prophecy, if Judah is focusing on Judah and Ephraim on Ephraim, they will never meet each other. Because Ephraim will mind Ephraim's stuff and Judah will mind Judah's stuff. In the character development that has and must take place, the focus is on the Father. And then there's the common ground. But then, do not quarrel along the way. So the brothers suffered resource scarcity while they were in the land and it made them beggars. Joseph had resource abundance while outside of the land, but he was the preserver of life. But united, they were to, to the glory of the Father and they were able to shift their focuses from their individual perspectives. So where are we? Well, we're obviously not in the land. We are at this stage, by the grace and the kindness of our Father, He has blessed us with abundance to help and to preserve life. And that's what our focus is, is to preserve life. Christus spoke about that a few minutes ago. But in the being together is to the glory of the Father. Hanley prayed about it. This time is not for division. It's for uniting to the glory of the Father. We can easily say, yeah, but you and this and you and that. Do not quarrel along the way. <laughs> Do not quarrel along the way. Does not bring glory unto the Father. So, Joseph had this immense power where he could just completely squash them. And it was not even necessary for him to reveal his identity because they didn't know who he was. But when under control of our Father and to the glory of the Father, that strength, that immense strength, can be bridled by His Spirit towards His objectives, towards His purpose. And see what came out of that, the beautiful reunification. And I believe that is such a powerful image for us we can revel in our strength. We can revel in what we know. We can revel in our resources. And we can become very arrogant about that occasionally. Or it can become, by the grace and the kindness and the spirit of our Father, a source of inner strength to work with towards the glory of the Father. The parallel story of I am Joseph is I am He, I am Yeshua. I find it absolutely amazing, wonderfully amazing, is that the portion within the New Testament that runs with the Joseph story is the story of the people going to Emmaus. And see, two of them were going that same day to a village of called Emmaus, which was 12 kilometers from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other of all this which had taken place. And it came to be, as they were taking, talking and reasoning, that Yeshua himself drew near, which is, by the way, the title of the Torah portion, to draw near, drew near. And I think that's also why this is the New Testament or apostolic, apostolic scripture portion and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so they did not know him. And then a little bit later on, and they approached the village where they were going and he seemed to be going on. And they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is towards evening and the day has declined. And he went in to stay with them. And it came to be when he sat at the table with them, having taken 
the lechem, the bread. He blessed, and having broken, he was given it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. At the breaking of the bread, they saw who he was. Their eyes were open. The brothers, they were hunting for bread. They were craving for bread. The people going to Emmaus, they were craving for answers because they were confused, completely confused. I can identify. Completely confused, craving for answers. They got bread, the brothers. The Emmaus goes, they found Yeshua. He revealed himself. As he was saying these eternal words, Baruch Ada Anunai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz As he said this Kiddush prayer, they saw him. Each Shabbat, many of us recite this. That prayer, our Messiah read when it, with the Emmaus goers. The same words. And at that moment, they saw who he was. The question here is, what was their attitude? What was their mental state? Where were they spiritually that a Messiah could reveal himself to them? And when we are at a Friday table and we say this prayer, where are we? Tired of the week? Very grateful it's Friday. Let's just get this done so that we can f enjoy the meal. Or with this deep anticipation, expectation, hunger for a revelation from the Messiah. And then the story continues. Yeshua, the bread of life, the Melech HaOlam, he was brought forth from the grave, from the earth. He was that one. And as he said those words, the king, blessed are you, king, uh, uh, Jehovah, God of our king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. They realize that he is the bread of life, been brought forth from the earth, who stood from, who rose from the dead, from the grave. And then they continue, the story continue in the book of Luke. And he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, Was not our heart burning with us as he was speaking to us on the way? And as he was opening the scripture to us? And rising up that same hour, they returned to Jerusalem. And found the eleven and those who were there with them gathered together, saying, The master was truly raised and has appeared to Shimeon. And they relate what took place on the way and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were saying this, Yeshua himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. So the Emma's goers were there. Actually, they brought the news and they told them, Hey guys, he is alive. He is truly the bread of life. As we broke the bread and we say, Hamotze, Lechem, Men, Haaretz, at that words, he revealed it to himself. He is the one who brought, was brought forth from the grave, from the earth. And he said, and being started and frightened, they thought they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And saying this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they were still not believing for joy and marveling, he said to them, Have you any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And taking it, he ate in their presence, and he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all have to be filled with that were written in the Torah of Moshe and the uh, prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their minds 
to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it has been written, and so it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. Even the Messiah had to go through the pain in order for him, for him to be developed into the, the glory that has happened and to rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these matters. It is to begin in Jerusalem, it's to end in Jerusalem. That's the center. I am sending the promise of my Father, the Ruach HaKodesh, upon you, but you are to remain in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And he is the bread of life. And there he revealed himself to his disciples at that breaking of bread. And so a few themes are, are coming together here. The revelation of the Messiah, Shabbat, bread, and famine, or then the absence of famine. And here is the concept of the bread of life, I think, so important. John 6, and Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not get hungry at all. What does that mean? That's the absence of famine. Because if you're hungry, then there's famine. This is the absence of famine. It's the counterpart thereof, the opposite thereof. Will not get hungry at all. There will be no famine. And he who believes in me shall not get thirsty at all. But I say to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me I shall by no means cast out, because I have come down from the heaven, not to do my own desire, but the desire of whom who sent me. This is the desire of my Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should not lose of it, but should raise it on the last day. Our Messiah himself declaring the mission, his mission statement, that he will not lose anybody. Think of what we said a little bit earlier in terms of the brothers. They were together, the brothers. Joseph was separate. He was lost. Joseph had a focus. He must provide for the world. The brothers had a focus. We need to get bread. The moment they were together, to the glory of the Father, Messiah. In Messiah, not one to be lost to the glory of the Father. And this is the desire of Him who sent me, which is the Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him should possess everlasting life, and I shall raise Him up in the last day. Joseph was sent by the Father, so was our Messiah. Why was Joseph sent? To be the preserver of life. Our Messiah, the physical manifestation of the unseen Father. In both these tales, the Father is not present. But he's manifested through Joseph and he's manifested through Messiah. Unto life. Therefore, the Yudim were grumbling against him because he said, I am the bread of, which came down from the heavens. And they said, is not this Joseph, Yeshua, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down or out of the heaven? And Yeshua answered them and said, Do not grumble with one another. Where did we see that? Joseph. Do not grumble. I mean, he answers them Joseph's story. I mean, you can't make this up. Do not grumble with one another. No one is able to come to me Unless the Father who sends me draws him, which is, this, which is Joseph's story. Joseph been sent by the Father, drawn to you, Joseph, and the unification there. It's Joseph's words to his brothers. The bread is for unity, not for division. 
and I shall raise him up in the last day, those people that Father has given him. It has been written in the prophets, and they shall be, and they shall all be taught by Jehovah. So it's Joseph who unites the brothers. Everyone then who has heard from the Father and learned comes to me, comes to Yeshua, comes to Joseph. It's that line that I've underlined is so packed. Everyone then. Does that include everyone? Everyone then. Irrespective of language, culture, where you are. Everyone then who has heard from the Father and learned. You can hear but not learn. learn. I mean that is obviously a consequence thereof. You can hear but not learn. If you've heard the Father and you've learned, then you will come to Messiah. You will, then you will go to Joseph. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from Elohim. He has seen the Father. But truly, truly I say to you, he who believes in me possesses everlasting life. I am the bread of life. And in him, there is no more famine. And I believe that as the world is progressing, we are starting and seeing more and more forms of famine emerging. Intellectual famine, moral famine, ethical famine, famine on all sorts of different terrains. Not just famine of bread, even though that as well. But in Yeshua, there's healing. But in Yeshua. And so, a strong message. No bread, there is famine. But Yeshua, also then from the spiritual famine. And so we can contrast this. Yeshua, the bread of life, spiritual, is broken, is placed in the earth. The seed that died but which rendered fruit, and we are here as to that fruit. The physical bread is broken, it's eaten, it's placed in an earthly vessel when we eat it. We are the earthly vessel when we eat it. From seed that died, rendering fruit unto our lives. No Yeshua, no bread, there's famine. There's no family table, there's no togetherness, there's no collective, there's just the individual. I want bread, and I want it now. Give it to me. What price? But then, with Yeshua, with bread, there's a reunion at the breaking of the bread. At a family table, there's restoration, there's celebration, and there's life. And the Messiah story and the Joseph story, the brothers going seeking for bread, the people from Emmaus seeking answers for their confusion, the one receiving grains and physical bread, but united with your Joseph, the others receiving the Messiah, reunited with the family in the room, celebrating him at the breaking of bread. So the believers experienced spiritual famine in their confusion where the brothers had the physical famine. They were seeking bread for their beings, the Emmaus goers, the believers from Emmaus. The brothers were seeking bread for their bodies. But both were ready to receive. Both were in a position ready to receive and prepared to receive. The one received Yeshua, the others received their brothers. But the result is... They went from famine to revelation to unification to family. I think that is Ezekiel 37. I think that's what the Ezekiel 37 pro prophecy is trying to tell us. You're from this position of two sticks in this division. You're in famine. You're hungry. You're longing for a, for a brother. You're longing for something. But, but you're not even sure what it is and you're asking the wrong questions. But then there is the I am He. 
and the unification and the family. So, the last scripture, Luke 11. So what are we asking today in this hour where we have got a plague of different forms of famine? All kinds of different famine that is plaguing the world. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone asking receives and he who is ask, seeking finds. And to him who is knocking it shall be opened. And what father among you the son is asking for bread, for that which sustains his life shall give him a stone which cannot sustain life. Or if he asks a fish, a fish is the symbol for fellowship, for being together, for a congregation, for fellow believers, shall give him a snake, the adversary, instead of a fish. Or if he asks for an egg, the source of life, shall give him a scorpion, that which will kill life. How much more shall your Father from heaven give you the set-apart spirit to those asking him? And I think this is where I would like to conclude with a prayer. And what I've done is I've, mer I've taken texts from Genesis 44, from Judah's intercession in prayer in front of Joseph on behalf of Benjamin, and Ezekiel 37, and build a prayer for this hour, I believe, where we can ask our Father that He will unite us, that He will be our bread of life, and that He will bring His word into fruition to the glory of the Father. Shall we pray? O Jehovah, please, let your servant speak a word in your hearing, and do not let your displeasure burn against your servant, for you are the king of the universe. You have once called the prophet Ezekiel to write our names on a stick. Today, we respond to that call. We, your children, grafted in the companions of Ephraim are scattered among the Gentiles where we have gone because of our sin. We choose this day, however, to turn from our wicked ways and not to defile ourselves with the idols of the land and of the nations in which we are. We choose not to engage with their disgusting matters, nor with any of their transgressions. We thank you that you have and will clean us, so that we are and can be your people. O Jehovah, you have declared that you will bring us back and turn us into one nation again, that we will dwell in the land that you have given to Yaakov, your servant the land where you, our fathers dwelt, that we will dwell on the mountains of Israel with one sovereign, Yeshua, our shepherd, the bread of life, guiding us in your guiding right rulings while guarding and doing your laws. Thank you that you are our Elohim, that you will rescue us from all our dwelling places and that you will gather us and bring us into the land which you have promised our fathers by covenant. However, you, O Master Yeshua, had asked your servants, do you have a brother? For long, for centuries, we have said to our Master that our brother was dead, devoured, ripped apart. But Master, we have sinned. O oh Master, we have a brother whom the Father loves. A brother, if he is to be separated from our Father, our Father shall most certainly die because of love. For how can we go to our Father if we do not bring him before him? For if we do not, we will be sinners forever. For how do we go up to our Father 
if Judah is not with us. We pray, Yeshua, that we will no longer be divided into two reigns, but be made whole, restored to the glory of the Father. May we come to you to learn and hear. May we and our children and our children's children dwell in the land together forever. And may you be our Prince of Peace, our Sar Shalom, according to an everlasting covenant. You are our Elohim, and we are your people. Amen. There's a last picture with the seed that grows from the word, because his word is the seed. And I believe it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very old word. I mean, it's not a new, fresh word. But it, every day that we live, and every day that we see the news and everything that's unfolding, his word and his seed becomes even more important. And that we pray into prophecy, that the prophecy will become real. And to his glory, the glory of our Father. Hallelujah.